What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for that swift news. Two pieces of housekeeping real quick before we get started. I know many of you out there may not know that I have a podcast, iOS Dev Discussions. I'm bringing that back. Took a couple months break from it. But that has shows, uh, you know, talking about what I'm working on as an indie developer. So if you're curious, like, how an indie developer, you know, makes a living via the, the content creation business, you know, consulting, indie apps, that's the show for you to check out. I'm also bringing back origin stories. Uh, a lot of people love that show. That's where I bring on uh, developers from the community to talk about, you know, how they got started. Like, how did they even learn to code in the first place? Why did they even choose iOS over something like web development? And, and how did they get that first iOS developer job? So that's coming back soon too. Uh, second thing is a lot of people, since I brought back Swift News, have asked how they can support, you know, what's your Patreon? Well, I, I got rid of the Patreon. It was, it was just too much to manage. So YouTube has a join button that you'll see down below. So if Swift News brings you value or any other videos on the channel bring you value and you're looking for ways to support, uh, check out that join button and see what that's all about. All right, let's dive into the news. Let's kick things off with something you already know, almost 100% you already know this. <laughs> Apple is uh, hosting uh, the virtual WWDC on June 22nd. So we finally got the date here. And uh, the big thing to know, I'm gonna speed through this because you already know this most likely, but uh, you can watch this on the Apple developer app uh, or the Apple developer website. So that Apple developer app is on your iPhone, your iPad, your Apple TV. So if you haven't downloaded that, I'd recommend downloading that, or you can just watch on the Apple developer website, which is usually how I watch anyway. But anyway, yep, June 22nd, uh, WWDC date is official. Next, I guess we'll talk about the uh, SE0279 proposal, multiple trailing closures that got accepted. Uh, to say this was controversial might be a, a bit of an understatement. Uh, I mean, you can read through this and then, you know, if you're up for uh, an entertaining little bit, you can kind of read through the whole forum post. I'm not going to do that, obviously. But essentially, this uh, how, how would you multiple trailing closures got accepted and many people weren't happy with that into Swift. So as you can see, however, many reviewers continue to oppose the amended proposal. Some reviewers express their uh, dislike of trailing closures overall disputed the need to even allow multiple trailing closures. Uh, you know, other reviewers dislike the specifics around, um, you know, not allowing uh, an argument label on the first closure and not giving somebody the option to include that. Uh, again, you can read all the, uh, the things people were dissatisfied with, and you probably saw this on Twitter. Uh, so if you are interested in multiple trailing closures and you want to see like what it even is that caused this, you know, you can click on this. As always, links in the description. We'll make this bigger. Uh, for you to see. Um, you can see the code on, you know, what this means and all that. But uh, my opinion, in case you're wondering, is, I don't know, I just, I'm just not concerned with things like this. Um, don't get me wrong, this is just me. Like, here's here's my take on this stuff, and I'm, I'm fully admit that I may be in the minority here, but dude, I just enjoy building products for the Apple platform. I've self-admitted Apple fanboy. I just enjoy building products for it. So even if Xcode was the worst IDE in the world, Swift was the worst, most headache-ridden language in the world, I just suck it up and do it, right? So I completely get why people, you know, may be very particular about these language features. I am not saying you are wrong for caring at all. Uh, again, this is just my opinion. I don't know, stuff like this just doesn't really come on my radar. Like, okay, cool, that's how we do multiple trailing closures? Cool, I'll live with it. That's just how I feel about it. Again, I'm not saying you're wrong if you don't, but figured I'd throw my opinion in here on this. Next, we have John Sindel and his YouTube channel, by the way. If you're not subscribed, I recommend checking out John Sindel's YouTube channel. Uh, only 2.16 thousand uh, subscribers. Let's fix that. But he has a great video here. It's, it's silenced, by the way, of course, obviously, on MVC, as you see, Model View Controller in how, you know, because I've said this a lot, like I believe MVC will solve pretty much all your problems. I think all these other architectures are just being too clever for their own good. For the most part, uh, I use MVC in pretty much all my projects. But this video by John is all about you know, because the biggest knock on MVC is like this, oh, massive view controller and all that stuff. Well, this video will talk about how you can break up the C part, the controller part. This is timing up nicely, <laughs> not planned. Uh, the the controller part into many different types of controllers. And so this is a way if you are struggling with MVC and, you know, you have these massive view controllers, definitely check out this video by John to help you break those down and, and use composition to, you know, fix that massive view controller problem. 
Moving on, we have an article from DHH. Uh, if you're not familiar, very prominent developer in the software development community. He's the creator of Ruby on Rails, founder of Basecamp. Uh, anyway, he has an article all about hiring programmers with a take-home test. You may know I have a course out there all about the take-home test. So he, uh, like he says here, uh, there's no perfect process in hiring great programmers, but there are plenty of terrible ways to screw it up. He talks about how Basecamp has rejected all the, you know, the whiteboarding, the brain teasers, and they've really embraced the take-home project. And he talks about the details on how they use it, right? He doesn't uh, give the take-home project to everybody as like a screener. They only give it to, as you see here, late stage candidates. So this is only once you've made it like really, really far in the interview process. And he goes on to talk about how like, yes, of course you don't want to give 20, 30, 40 hour projects, right? Because that's one of the main knocks on the take home project is, you know, it takes up a lot of developers time. More on that later in the article, but you know, he definitely doesn't recommend giving a 20, 30 hour project unless you're going to pay them for it. Um, but he talks about how they give one uh, that takes about three to five hours to complete. And he still says that is still a very substantial commitment, but how he justifies it, which I agree with, he says, uh, you know, it's worth contrasting against what we're not asking people to do. They don't, he says, send them through the recruiter mill. They don't have to do one hour phone screens where if you've ever done those, you know, you're kind of prepping, studying for those. Those take a lot of time too. You know, they don't have an automated tool that scans resumes. They, they don't ask people to travel for interviews. So when you contrast it to the normal interview process, you know, spending three to five hours on a take home project, I don't know, looks pretty attractive to me. But again, I'm biased. I'm a big fan of the take home project and I know some people aren't. So I will fully state my bias here. And he also talks about how like the rules of the game are specified up front. Like you shouldn't apply uh, to Basecamp unless you're prepared to put in the work, writing a, a tailored cover letter and then making a three to five hour commitment to complete this process. But like he says, this is only if you make it to the top one to 3% of applicants. So it's not like everybody gets this take home project. But anyway, like I said, it's pretty well known. I'm a fan of the take home project. I understand if you're not, but I thought this article was interesting again by a, a very prominent developer talking about how they hire at their company. Let's move on to the Swift UI portion of the show. Got a few Swift UI articles for you. Who knows? Maybe in a in a year or two, this will be a completely Swift UI show. Swift UI news. Who knows? Probably not. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the complete guide to navigation view in Swift UI by Paul Hudson. Now, if you've ever tried to Google your way through a Swift UI project as you're learning to build it, you're probably going to find a hacking Swift article with the solution you're looking for. So Paul has become a amazing resource uh, for Swift UI. But what he's doing now is starting to Take all that and put it together into these like ultimate guides. And here's the first one, right? The complete guide on navigation view in Swift UI. Now, like I said, I don't have a ton of firsthand experience in Swift UI yet, but from what I've heard, the navigation view can be kind of tricky. So Paul's put all that together. He has a 40 minute video. If you're into video, if you're not the video learner, here's a huge long article. I'm gonna scroll down really, really quick, quickly just to show you how long it is, but all about the, the navigation view. So if you really wanna drill this core fundamental skill about the navigation view in Swift UI, here you go. And then he's doing the same thing in uh, just the complete guide for layout in Swift UI. So I don't know what he's doing. I don't know his plans, but uh, if you go by the trend, these complete guides, I imagine we'll see more of these in the future. And I think it'll be a great way to just, again, drill those fundamentals of Swift UI. So again, you want layout. He's got videos here too, except, you know, these ones are, you know, shorter than the big 40 minute one, but there's multiple uh, videos. So like I said, it looks like Paul is kind of just uh, bundling a lot of his articles into these complete guides, which I am thankful for just a one-stop shop to learn these fundamentals. So if you're learning Swift UI, check this out. Keeping the Swift UI train going here, we have Jared Sinclair with what he's calling the Swift UI cheat sheet, right? And again, I'm at my very beginner phase of Swift UI. Real quick, talking about that, you know, I spent my whole career doing object oriented programming, right? UI kit, Swift. So this whole declarative paradigm is completely new to me. I've never done reactive programming. So I am just absolute beginner again, which is kind of fun. Um, so this stuff is super helpful for me, right? And it's when should I use at state, at binding, at observed object, environment object, environment. And this was very confusing for me just learning this. So Jared's got a, a great cheat sheet for you here. If you want the real quick cheat sheet, here you go. You state this, use at binding this. Uh, and then you go into more in depth uh, later in the article. And again, I'm gonna scroll through fast just to illustrate how long and in depth it is with the code examples. Uh, again, we're not here to just read articles of Swift News. I just wanna point you in the right direction and point out some cool stuff. So again, uh, we're kind of giving a, a Swift UI starter kit here uh, for some of the fundamentals, but uh, I thought it'd be interesting to share. 
In the last part of the Swift UI train, the caboose, if you will, uh, build a Swift UI Animal Crossing app, right? Animal Crossing is like the, the hot trend right now if you got a Nintendo Switch. And, you know, maybe if you're learning Swift UI, you're into Animal Crossing, this can be a beautiful uh, combination for you. But it's by Thomas Ricard, who has put together a Swift UI movie app that also illustrated that. And that he used uh, Redux, which was another way to uh, handle your models. And this one, he decided to use Apple's first party uh, combine. So if you're into that, but uh, here's kind of what the app looks like. And as you can see, this is just part one. I don't know if part two's out yet. This just came out May 7th. I don't think it is. But anyway, uh, so be on the lookout for future parts of this article. But again, if you're into Swift UI, Combine, and Animal Crossing, I definitely think you're going to love this article. And you can build this project along with Thomas uh, because he does make all this open source. Next, we got an article by Revenue Cat, uh, which I found very, very interesting. Again, as now an indie developer, part of my plans is to eventually develop an app and not, not develop it with the whole goal of selling it, but right, but you know, you spend five, six years building an app it'd probably be nice to have the option to be like, okay, how do I sell this thing if a good offer comes along? So that's what this article is all about. Like, how much is my app worth and how do I sell it? So we'll point out some highlights here, but I highly recommend checking out the article. But there's some requirements that I, I really hope, and I think Apple has to change, right? So first of all, can you sell your app, right? Imagine selling an app, you have to transfer the app to another account, or you would have to transfer your entire developer account to somebody, which many of you may not want to do. So here's some things to keep in mind. Uh, if you have any iCloud entitlements or Passbook entitlements, or if you're using sign in with Apple, which is probably going to be very common moving forward. And again, Mac apps created with Mac Catalyst, which again, I think are going to be common moving forward. You cannot transfer an app that, uh, has any of that stuff, which again, because I think sign in with Apple and Catalyst are going to be very commonplace, you know, in the future, I'm going to guess Apple changes these. Of course, I don't know. That's just my guess, but I would think they would have to, because if not, you're either going to have to create a brand new developer account and an LLC. Uh, that way you have the option to sell an app in the future. Because again, like I said, if you're building any of this signing with Apple catalyst on your personal developer account, you have to transfer your entire account, not just the one app. So I don't know, hopefully they change that. Anyway, moving on, how much is my app worth? Talks about, you know, cut right to the chase here. Apps typically sell for 12 to 36 uh, X the app's monthly profit. Now that's a pretty wide range because you can imagine different types of apps are gonna sell for more than others. Uh, they even mentioned later that like, you know, if your app is easily like copied, you know, somebody can just whip up your functionality in like a, a couple weeks, that's probably gonna sell for less. But if you have some unique, you know, differentiators, that'll probably sell for more. Uh, you're probably wondering like why you should sell your app. And he, he gives it like a business case of, you know, if you're making a certain amount of money, you know, you can get into that. That's why you should sell your app, I think is such a highly personal question that, I don't know, this is maybe just like a rough guide. It's, it's pretty hard to give exact advice without hearing your exact situation. Uh, but here's what's interesting. How do I find a buyer for my app? And I didn't even know about this. There's like websites where you can like put your app up for sale. Um, and then talks about negotiation and all that stuff. So if you're an indie developer or I don't know, hell, maybe you have a, a cool side project that maybe you want to sell as some side income. Uh, I think this is a pretty good article to check out. I know it's super interesting to me. Next, there's an article by Guy Rambo, uh, the big Facebook crash of 2020 and the problem of third party SDK creep. Uh, if you're not familiar, just recently, uh, May 6, as you can see, uh, there was an issue with the uh, Facebook login. Even if your user wasn't using the Facebook login, because you had it in your app, it was causing your app to crash on, on launch. And he says, so I tried launching TikTok, Spotify, the app he's a contractor for. He's like, it, it was bad, like everything was crashing. And you can see here, if you're curious, you know, the issue was caused by some bad data uh, being sent by Facebook server to their SDK, uh, which caused code in the SDK to crash. So in turn brought down like everything. Um, but that's kind of what happened. Uh, but then he goes on to talk about, you know, the big SDK problem. And, you know, I don't want to like just pick on Facebook. You know, a lot of people pick on Facebook. It's just in general, right? When you're bringing in a lot of third parties, you're, you're bringing on risk. Now, I am not advocating to never use third parties. Some people advocate for that. But uh, I am advocating against just adding a third party library here all willy nilly without thinking of the consequences or thinking about the risk you're bringing on. So that's kind of the moral of the story. Feel free to read this, uh, this article talking about the Facebook SDK and what's going on. Uh, but I guess what I want to kind of stress and point out the lesson here is just, you know, don't add an SDK or a third party library to your app without seriously considering it. I know a lot of, especially new developers out there will be like, oh, this solves my problem. I don't have to code it myself. Cool, add it just be careful. 
Now on to AR Corner here. We have Ethan with a, a pretty cool mock-up of an of a Apple store, right? Many of us can't go to Apple stores now, so if you miss it, how they're, all the products are beautifully displayed on those nice hardwood tables, here you go. You can visit it uh, in AR. So I thought this was, was pretty cool. Next, we have Ryan here with a pretty good augmented reality thing. And by the way, these are a lot of these are like mock-ups, proof of concepts, um, but AirPods, you can like swipe and control AirPods, last played, what music, like just by swiping on the AirPods case and seeing it, like I thought that was a really cool concept. Uh, and then finally, uh, some LiDAR here, which, you know, I knew the iPad and stuff had LiDAR and the iPhone 12 is going to have LiDAR, but I don't, I'm not really into all this stuff, so I don't know much about it, but this is crazy. Just like walking through a park right now and you can see what the LiDAR is actually building around you. I don't know, man, this, this could make for some crazy AR experiences. And again, I got to give my usual caveat. Everything I show here is all about like the proof of concept and, and kind of like playing around with ideas. Uh, like I say all the time, AR is going to require some glasses, in my opinion, to really take off and go mainstream. As long as you got to hold up an iPad or a phone, eh. but you can see the beginnings of, of pretty cool things, in my opinion. And if you extrapolate that out, you know, five, six, seven years, I think it's going to be really cool. Uh, I guess time will tell. We'll see. That's going to wrap up this episode of Swift News. We'll see you two Mondays from now. Hope you enjoyed.